Hey, it's Amber, and I want to make sure you are aware of all the resources we have at Time of Grace to help you grow your faith. From our TV program with Pastor Mike Novotny to devotions, Grace Talk videos, our blog, and countless books, we want to encourage you to stay close to God. Just go to timeofgrace.org to sign up for our daily email. And now, here's today's episode. We are still in our There's More to the Story series with episode six titled, The In-Between. Hey guys, it's Amber, wife, mother, warrior, type A child of God. Here at Little Things, we examine everyday issues from a biblical perspective with one simple goal, to know and love God more. Thanks for joining me. When we left off in Esther chapter 4, Mordecai had convinced Esther to go to King Xerxes on behalf of the Jews. And I just want to revisit that for a little bit here with this episode, because those three days that Esther had where she asked Mordecai to gather the people to fast, she and her maids would do the same. You know, those had to have been some really trying days and nights. So afterwards, she was going to go to the king unsummoned. It was against the law for her to do so. And she had not been summoned for 30 days. Now, there are three reasons why this would be a really hard thing to do. Number one, she had no idea how Xerxes was going to respond to her coming into his presence without being summoned. Queen Vashti had been banished after she refused to do what King Xerxes said to come to him when she was summoned, this was the exact opposite situation. Esther now was going to him without being summoned. And how would he respond to that? Would he see that as her being aggressive or, you know, doing something that really was seen as not okay um, from his perspective? She didn't know. Number two, she didn't know how he'd react to finding out that she was a Jew. She had previously kept this from him. And so she didn't know how he was going to respond finding out that, you know, she had kept this from him and that this impacted her life. And number three, it was Haman's plan that impacted her. So Haman was the king's right-hand man. How would he respond to finding out that Haman's plan actually was going to destroy her and her people? It could backfire. He could go with Haman and stand up for Haman instead of her. She just didn't know. So during those three days of fasting, and the people's Bible said that fasting was always accompanied by prayer, during those three days, These are the things that could have been going through her mind. And that left her in this in-between. She had no guarantee how Xerxes was going to respond. All she could do is go to God and beg for mercy. You too might find yourself in the in-between. It happens when you find out that the company that you've been working for is going to make job cuts and you have no idea if it's going to affect you or not. It happens when you get a diagnosis and it's, you know, a week or 10 days before you can get in to see a doctor about what this diagnosis means. And then there's treatments and you don't know how you're going to respond to the treatments. And so you're in this period of in between knowing that something is wrong, having no idea what the outcome is going to be. It happens when we have prodigals in our life, lives, people who have stepped away from God, who no longer believe in God, who walk away from the lifestyle that would honor God, and they embrace a lifestyle and a time of their life where they don't care about God. And you pray and you prod and you talk when you're able if they answer the phone, but you have no way of knowing where this is going if they'll return, when they'll return. So you are left in that time of in-between, praying and begging God to change their hearts, use the Holy Spirit to 
put faith in their hearts and stoke their faith that was there and bring them back because eternally you want them to be with you in heaven. Now, the Bible is so good because it shows us so many times that people were in the in-between. So think for um, example of Jonah. So Jonah was asked by God to go to the people of Nineveh, and he didn't feel like doing that. So instead, he got on a boat that was headed towards Joppa. God allowed a storm to come, and the people on the ship knew that something somebody had done something. So they woke Jonah up. He was sleeping below deck and said, you know, are you the reason that this storm is happening? And he confessed that he was. And he said, you know, just pick me up and throw me into the sea, which the, they didn't want to do. They figured it, it was certain death to do so. So they tried. But when they finally realized that if they didn't throw Jonah into the sea, the ship would certainly be lost. Then they decided to throw him into the sea and God allowed a fish to swallow him. Now we read these things in the Bible and we're like, oh, okay, cool. A fish swallowed Jonah. Well, Jonah was in the fish for three days. So I don't know about you, but I can't imagine how terrifying it would be to be in the belly of a fish for three days. I mean, you imagine an hour turns to two hours, turns to eight hours, turns to 12 hours. And Jonah must have been wondering when or if God was ever going to allow him to get out of the inside of that fish. Or think of King David. He had to leave. He went on the run because King Saul was going to kill him. This was before King David was King David. This was when this was just shepherd boy turned into warrior for the current king, Saul, was in Saul's household and Saul became jealous because Saul knew that God was with David and he knew that God had given the throne to David. And so in order to protect his legacy and in order to protect the dynasty that he wanted for his family, he decided he needed to kill David. So David went on the run and not just for a day or two, but for seemingly years. We don't know exactly how long David was on the run, but he moved his family out of the country. I mean, this was a big deal. And Saul would chase him, and then Saul would have to go fight the Philistines, and then Saul would come back to chasing David. And David lived that way, not knowing when God was going to come to his rescue. Or how about Mary and Martha? Their brother became ill, and they sent word to Jesus, and Jesus didn't come. And so for a time... They watched as their brother died and Lazarus died and he was in the grave and four days had passed before Jesus showed up. There's that time in the in-between like, where are you? Why aren't you coming? Why are you ignoring us? Do you understand what we're going through? Three days, four days. 14 days, those are nothing compared to what Joseph endured. He was in prison for two years. He had been taken from his homeland. He had been put in the service of Potiphar. And when Potiphar's wife started hitting on him and he did not reciprocate, she finally found a way to convince her husband that Joseph was trying to sleep with her. And so he was put in prison. He told the cupbearer who had been in the prison, was raised back to his position, hey, remember me. Tell Pharaoh about me. Get me out of this place. I don't deserve to be here. And of course, the cupbearer didn't. He forgot. So two years passed before the cupbearer remembered, hey, I know a person who can interpret dreams and called for Joseph. Maybe for you, 
the in-between has been so much more than two years. That conflict at church, it's gone on for three or four or five years. You've cried out to the Lord. You've gone to the people you were supposed to go to. And yet the tormenting continues. Or you've prayed for your spouse or your sibling or the friend who hasn't been able to talk to them closest to them about the addiction or the mental illness. Maybe you're the one with a crippling addiction. Maybe you have a mental illness. You read your Bible, you pray, you love the Lord, but you haven't been able to lose the weight. You haven't been able to quit drinking or shake the anxiety. What are you doing in the in-between? I have four things that I came up with that can help us when we're in the in-between, just vacillating between what was and what may be, but we don't know when the outcome is hidden and we're just living in faith, hoping, praying, trusting that God will do something, but we're not seeing it. Number one, praise. I know it sounds crazy, but it's actually biblical. David wrote Psalms while he was on the run. When he and Bathsheba had a child and the child died, he worshiped. Job worshiped when all was lost. God is God in the good, and he's equally God in the bad. He's never left the throne. He's never forgotten about you. There is a plan. And while you're holding on, you might as well pray. Those instances that I gave you before Jonah, he was vomited out onto dry land after three days. Joseph, yes, he endured those two years, but then he became second in command. Lazarus was raised from the dead. There was something in the works. It wasn't that God didn't know what was going to happen or that God couldn't figure out how to make it happen. There was still a plan. Martin Luther said, come, let us sing a psalm and chase away the devil. I like to think that when I worship in the middle of the in-between, when I'm waiting on the Lord, I'm doing two things. First of all, in 1 Thessalonians 5.19, we're told, don't put out the Spirit's fire. In a whole lot of things that we listen to or could listen to in our homes, secular music, those lyrics could put out the Spirit's fire because a lot of secular lyrics are talking about sin and going, you know, our own way and doing our own thing and embracing sin and getting our pleasure and doing what makes us happy. Whereas worship music instead reminds us that God is in the situation. So we're inviting the spirit. We're calling on the spirit. We're worshiping God. We're asking him to be part of our home. And then second, we are hopefully prayerfully changing our attitude in the meantime. So many times those worship songs are like a good friend reminding us that God is still here. Don't take your eyes off him. Fix your eyes on Jesus. He's on the throne. He sees you. He knows you. Here are four of my favorite worship songs, if you're looking for some favorites in the in-between. There's two from Phil Wickham that I go back to over and over and over. The first one is, It's Always Been You, just talking about how God has always been there. He's always been there in every trouble. He's been my compass. And that just reminds me, he will still be there now. He's been there. It's always been him. And he will continue to be. And then The Secret Place by Phil Wickham, which I love. He um, has a, a woman who sings with him on that song. Beautiful voice. And The Secret Place is the place we go to, you know, read the word and worship God and just running to that secret place and finding our peace there and remembering who he is when we get there. Then I love Hard Love by Need to Breathe. 
just talks about, you know, get up, keep going, don't give up. You're going to you're going to stay in this. Stay in the game. And I love Though You Slay Me by John and um John Piper and Shane and Shane. Shane and Shane is the band. John Piper is a pastor who there's a little section of him talking and just reminding me, reminding anyone who listens that there is meaning in the suffering. Find the meaning, embrace the meaning, be okay with the suffering, which by the way is, you know, really what James said when he said, you know, computer, consider it pure joy, but we're going to get to that. So number two, remember that hard times build strong Christians. Now I know that we would all love smooth sailing, but that's not for our best necessarily. Franklin D. Roosevelt said this, a smooth sea never made a skilled sailor. In other, ta- in other words, hard times are where we learn. We learn to trust God and we learn that with God, we can do hard things. This is where James, Jesus' half-brother, said, consider pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. We don't want to stay baby Christians. Baby Christians do not fight. They they can't. They, they are not equipped to fight. Babies aren't equipped to fight. They need to be taken care of. But as we mature, we become stronger so that we can be warriors for God in all the battles that we have to face all throughout our life. There's a quote that says, don't ask God to make your life easier. Ask him to make you stronger. In other countries, they tend to ask for the strength to get through their problems. Whereas in America, we tend to just ask God to take our our problems away. But that is not going to help us become stronger, braver, more courageous. That isn't going to help us fight the battles that Satan is going to throw the church into because that's his job. As we endure, we are maturing. We are becoming stronger. We are persevering and we are becoming mature. So don't neglect the refining that is taking place in you as you wait in the in-between. Number three, we never, ever want to get to a point that we think that we don't need God. Now, I did a whole podcast that was called Never Outgrow Your Need for God. And I talked a lot about the kings in the Old Testament and how so often they all started the same. They started out very much needing God, knowing that they needing, needed God and going to him and begging him to be with them. And God in his mercy was. And they would go out and they would win wars and they would do amazing things. And then all of a sudden, they didn't need God so much anymore. Tough times tend to keep us on our knees. They keep us seeking God, praying, listening to the word. And in that way, Hard times are a major blessing because pride is going to pull us from God. It keeps us from intimacy with him. Pride says, God, I don't need you. I've got this. It's all under control. Whereas humility is us saying, God, I can't do this on my own. I am completely and totally helpless. I am your child and I want to honor you and I want to glorify you, but man, if you are not holding me, and if you are not working in this situation, I guarantee you this is not going to go well. And number four, gratitude, gratitude, and a little more gratitude. I work at a nursing home. Most of you know that if you've been listening to this for any amount of time. And there is a room where two men reside. They share a room, both in similar situations. 
They've both been in the nursing home for less than a year. Their wives are still at home, but they need just a little too much care to be at home. One man constantly complains. Nothing is ever right. Doesn't matter what we do. We haven't done it soon enough. We didn't do it the right way. There's a different way. Nobody thinks of him. Everything is always bad, bad, bad. And the other man is just full of joy. He is so grateful. Every time you walk into the room, he asks how your day is. He thanks you for being there. He can't stop thanking you for what a great job you're doing. Now, neither one of them has changed their situation with their attitude. But one person is enjoying their their stay way more than the other one. Not only is the one who is grateful not bummed out about life, but he is talking to friends, people that he's met in the nursing home, who he is befriended. He's wheeling his wheelchair down to watch baseball games with other residents. He has endeared himself to the staff. Same situation. The situation hasn't changed, but his attitude makes the situation bearable. Your attitude affects your thinking, which in turn affects your feelings, which in turn affects your actions. I guarantee you there are things in your life to be grateful for right now in the in between. God is still blessing you. He may be sending people to walk alongside of you during this time. Imagine if you didn't have your spouse or your sister or your best friend or whoever it is that has been by your side. Imagine if you didn't have a roof over your head or if you didn't have the groceries or the medical team or if you didn't have the skills that mean that you'll be able to get a different job if you've lost yours. God provides in so many different ways and we just have to notice One of the things that I've been doing, I'm in the in-between. I've been in the in-between for a year. I am, you know, working at a nursing home, but I'm not a member of the staff of the nursing home. I'm a traveler. I have zero guaranteed hours. And so I've been picking up this gig for a while and I fully expect at any time it will end. And I'm enjoying the sunrises and the sunsets as I drive to and from. I'm thankful for a good vehicle. I'm thankful for the scenic road that I can drive on, for having just good roads in general. I'm thankful for all the residents who have just blessed my life and for the perspective that they're giving me. I'm thankful for my coworkers who have reminded me of so many things because it's been such a long time since I've worked in the secular society. I had been working, volunteering, of course, Um, you know, in ministry for so many years, and I had worked very minimally outside of that. And here I am working full time in a secular environment. And it's just reminding me the importance of, you know, teaching the word, because there are so many people who do not know God, and don't know the things of God and don't know where to start. So there are always going to be things to find, to be thankful for if you just open your eyes and look for them. And sometimes you just need to pray that prayer. God, show me the blessings. Right now, I'm not seeing them. All I can see is the bad, but I don't want to dwell there. Show me where your blessing is. Tony Evans says, God doesn't give the hardest battles to his toughest soldiers. He creates the toughest soldiers through life's hardest battles. You know, if you're in a situation right now, if you're in the in-between and you really don't know how this is going to turn out, a good place to start is on your knees, praying, begging God to be in the situation and to help you find the way out, to work on your behalf and for the good of all those involved, and then praise. And remember that God is refining you. And thank God that you definitely need him. And remember to be grateful. Because God is working. 
and he hasn't forgotten you. And you are the apple of his eye. This has been Little Things, because in God's kingdom, the little things are the big things. Thanks for listening to Little Things today. I know that there are so many things that you could listen to, so I don't take it for granted that you are here listening to me now. I want to listen to you. If you have any feedback or suggestions, if there's topics that you'd like to see me cover, or if you'd just like to say hi, go ahead and drop me an email at amber at timeofgrace.org. 